Welcome to Declassifying the Paranormal. Here we reveal the secrets that sinister organizations attempt to conceal from the world, objects and entities that could shake the very foundations of what we think is, and is not, possible. Today we have secured documents belonging to the SCP Foundation, and will reveal to you the nature of SCP-2746. Item Number, SCP-2746 Object Class, Euclid Special Containment Procedures The main entrance to SCP-2746 is to be cordoned off, and is only to be accessible via Storage Room 111-1, SR 111-1. Due to SCP-2746's location in a heavily populated area, the door to SR-111-1 is to be monitored from Site 45-A, which is tasked with responding to any attempts to vandalize or break into SCP-2746. This door is to be equipped with a deadbolt lock to prevent civilian interference. Personnel are to be given large, disposable gowns to wear in place of original clothing while traveling through SCP-2746. Before traveling through SCP-2746, personnel are required to remove any clothing and personal accessories from their person, excluding protective gear and accessories used for medical or eye correction purposes. Due to the nature of SCP-2746, most clothing and equipment has been deemed unnecessary for exploration into SCP-2746-1 and must be stored in a designated storage locker in SR-111-1. Upon arrival to SCP-2746-1, personnel are to deposit these gowns in Storage Room 111-2, SR-111-2. When returning, gowns should be retrieved after exploration for either reuse or disposal and all personal effects should be collected. Equipment needed for exploration into SCP-2746-1 must be carried entirely through baggage, and be tailored for animal use if possible. Description, SCP-2746 is an underground tunnel located in Las Vegas, Nevada, approximately 250 meters north of Site 45-A. SCP-2746 primarily functions as a stable, two-way portal between Las Vegas and an extra-dimensional space, designated SCP-2746-1. On the left side of SCP-2746's main entrances are two storage rooms, Storage Room 111-1. SR-111-1, located within Las Vegas, and Storage Room 111-2, SR-111-2, located within SCP-2746-1. Both of these rooms have a door leading to the exterior, and a door leading to the interior of SCP-2746. As a human travels through SCP-2746, they will take on the physical appearance of a non-human animal. No pattern or explanation has been determined to explain why the transformation results in any particular species. This process has been observed to begin with the subject's skeletal structure, and end with the skin, size, and internal-slash-external organs matching those of the non-human species. Human subjects retain their vocal cords and sapience when they arrive at SCP-2746-1. Non-human subjects do not undergo the same changes as human subjects when crossing SCP-2746. When any organism, excluding humans, approaches SCP-2746-1, they will only develop functional vocal cords. They retain their level of intelligence while within SCP-2746-1, but may be capable of repeating rudimentary or familiar phrases depending on their intelligence. This effect will progress as the subject travels through SCP-2746, and will be complete when he or she reaches SCP-2746-1. This process will reverse itself as they return to Las Vegas. It is currently unknown whether this effect stems from SCP-2746, or a proximity to SCP-2746-1. SCP-2746-1 is a forested landmass approximately 111 kilometers in diameter. Examination of the outer boundaries of the landmass suggested to be floating in midair. Atmospheric pressure and temperature are comparable to temperate earth conditions at sea level. Records located within SCP-2746-1 suggest that the landmass was inhabited by sapient, non-human animals, estimated 770 to 780 in number. These inhabitants appear to have been able to construct complex structures and tools, and have formed a pious, 
redacted based oligarchy. According to records discovered in the ruins of several government-supported churches, the social class and hierarchy of the population of SCP-2746-1 was divided into three groups, identified as IS Wa, crafters, Wa Royal, scholars, and oily Iapiri honorables. Addendum 2746, the crafters, who were 13 in number, are noted to have been the highest social class, below the Yizua, translation, the maker. It is unclear whether this term referred to a major religious figure or a god. The crafters are said to have played a vital role in the construction of both SCP-2746-1, and, Dadaf world as we know it expunged. The scholars represented the personal servants and assistants of the crafters, and were typically selected from the honorable social class after birth. The majority of inhabitants belonged to the honorable class, which consisted of artisans, carpenters, and artists. SCP-2746-1's economy functioned off of a barter system, and lacked any official form of currency. The former government's legislation suggests that the original inhabitants were incapable of dying, and originally did not require any food sources. This effect is not present in subjects entering SCP-2746-1. An estimated, redacted, years ago, the inhabitants of SCP-2746-1 were involved in a civil war, referred to as Event Nahash, which ended in the crucifixion of two crafters, the majority of the honorables and scholars, and the abandonment of SCP-2746-1 by the surviving inhabitants. According to recovered documents, Event Nahash was the result of the Maker declaring that humans were to be banished from SCP-2746-1, and that a penalty requiring that all citizens acquire the need to eat in order to preserve their sanity. Due to a lack of available food sources and farming knowledge, the honorable class resorted to eating other inhabitants while the scholar class was given access to several private gardens with a variety of fruit-bearing plants. A large majority of SCP-2746-1's population broke away from its government and formed an organization called the Scala Wise Translation, the Furies of Age, shortly after this penalty was put in place. This organization was led by former crafters Frederick and Agathos, and scholar Clovis with the goal of killing the maker due to unfair treatment. For more information on Event Nahash, please read attached addenda and documentation. Forward 2746 The following documents are flyers, letters, and documented speeches recovered while exploring SCP-2746-1. Barring document 2746-9, the majority of these documents were written in dialect 812, Old Angelic. Documentation not displayed here consisted of personal exchanges, trades and commissions, and literature. These documents can found in Recovered Documents 2746-2 and may be accessed by personnel with Level 2 2746 clearance or higher. Notice 2746-1 To all righteous citizens of A Following the banishment of A and E A Former headcrafters Frederick and Agathos have forsaken their holy duties, and proclaimed their traitorous ideals against our glorious Maker. Crafters Suwed and Sari will carry on their duties until our former leaders see their unjust acts. The traitors and all similarly minded citizens suspected of heeding their blasphemy are to be whipped, starved, and crucified for 108 cycles upon their capture in the hopes that we may restore both their divinity and grace. May our Maker forgive us for their transgressions. Notice 2746-2 To all righteous citizens of A The Furies of A Movement is A Blatant sin Against both the A Empire and Our glorious Maker 
If any members of this movement are found, the royal guard is to be notified of their presence. Immediately. So they may face. Eternal crucifixion. The heathens are great in number, and are. Immensely dangerous. Those who are found aiding them shall be considered genuine sympathizers of their cause, and shall face. Greater punishment. May our Maker forgive us for our transgressions. Letter 2746-3 Frederick, Agathos Can you not see the pain you are causing unto others? Do you not see your brothers' and sisters' eternal shells going helplessly mad along our paths? They are starving by our hands, and nothing but you are forcing them. You, and what you are doing, are wrong. We will not even let you make the attempt to harm our Maker, and are prepared to stand and fight you and every force in a- You have seduced Orgis to this pointless resistance. You have no right, but we cannot give up on you. We don't wish this upon you, but if need be, we will strand you here. Don't make it come to that, we could have so much more than this. If you have any decency, please, stop this pointless fighting. End the suffering. Release Clovis, and turn yourselves in. This can only end tragically. Suwed and Sari. Letter 2746-4 Suwed, Sari. While we are quite saddened that you and the other crafters do not share our views on our Maker, we would like you to understand that none of us give a damn. As you have pointed to us, our concern is placed on the citizens you have created examples of. You are aware that the overwhelming majority of the citizens you suspect of following us used to fear our Maker, correct? You are paranoid, and you are only hurting yourselves. The citizens curse you for following Him, and that makes their love go to us, to the point to where even your guards have deserted His cause for hours. It further amazes us that you believe Clovis has decided to follow us by anything other than her own volition. You act as if she is not capable of having her own will, that the only conceivable way that she could oppose you is by Geish. Our care goes to those who you have hurt, those you have starved and beaten. The ones that are truly suffering. When our time comes, our first act will be to set free our brothers and sisters, and allow them the privilege to be the first to consume our Maker's flesh and blood. We see no reason as to why the Maker has punished us for what the humans have done other than for cruel entertainment. This is your last chance. We can forgive you, but him we cannot. Do not stand in our way. We agree that we are wrong. We were made wrong. And we are hungry. Frederick and Agathos Speech 2746-5 Narrators, Preaching My sons, my daughters not too long ago, we lived in the greatest of times. Our Maker, whom we cherished, crafted thirteen spirits, and gave them one simple order. Craft. And so we did, grateful for our creation. We crafted the canvas, and every body it contains. We crafted the soil beneath our feet, and the trees that brushed the skies. We followed His example, and crafted 764 spirits, similar but unique to each other. Soon, for no other purpose than to craft, we created all that you have seen. It was because of you that we have what we have now. But then, we noticed something. What we have crafted was, still, it was boring, empty. There was nothing to appreciate and enjoy the things we have made. We created life, not the lives of mere plants, but the lives of walkers. Each of us created these wondrous designs, designs that were strong, designs that were agile, designs that differed wildly from each other. We presented our work to the Maker, like a child does with its first work of art, and He looked upon it all. It disgusted Him. He tore our worlds down, and we rebuilt them again, this time, with rules dictated what we could do, and what we could not, no longer could we stray from the mundane, but we could not stray from the impossible not entirely. We built our designs from each other's work, going down paths that the original Creator wouldn't usually go, 
adapting them for different surroundings, and making revisions. If the designs didn't work, and they didn't many times, we'd work on that design with different creations in different environments, and if it still didn't work, we would simply attempt something else, or leave it for others to find. It was still chaos, and we employed the use of magic every now and again, but we were happy. We, satisfied from our achievements, took the form of what we believed to be our best works, and presented the works to him a second time. He looked upon it, and disposed of it again. Only during the third time, when he gave us his direct supervision, or perhaps, when he inserted his own likeness, did he see our work was good. But we did not care, we have finally appeased our father's expectations, no matter how self-serving they might be. That is, until his creations became corrupt. The maker blamed this all on our designs, for being full of temptations. Our designs were only meant to be artistic expressions, or simple pleasures. His designs were greedy. They believed they were entitled to everything they saw, that we exist to serve them. Never forget that when they provoked sin, and we got punished for it. None of our creations felt that need, he crafted them to fail by design. We feel their greed, we can no longer craft, and they get what? They are simply banished from this place. Is that a worthy punishment? They go to create, they go to live and die, they go to eat, and let me remind you, they are eating your creations. Is that fair? No. No it is not. But you know what also isn't fair? Six to one odds. A hundred scholars stand in the way of an ocean of fire. Together, we have every advantage over those who still follow him. We will storm the house of the Maker, and make him witness the horrors he made us. If they strike you down, your mother and I will defend you. If they strike us down, we will all rise to fight again. We will end our hunger, and we will craft a fourth world, not for him, but for us, the way we as the true creators of a desire. One way or another, our victory is inevitable. Disciplinary Order 2746-6 With deep regret and respect, we execute Head Crafter Frederick's punishment for his atrocities towards our Maker. Frederick was our leader, second only to him. His leadership, ingenuity, and strength were the best of but were also his undoing. In better days, Frederick's greatest achievement was his design of the Great Fire, which has, and will provide us all with light for eons. His punishment will be a loss to all. Prior to his current state, Frederick has betrayed our Maker, and led all of citizens in revolt against him. Frederick's punishment has been tailored to reflect his actions. Frederick's final action was confronting the crafters and causing severe burns on Sari's face. Frederick was then paralyzed and apprehended through the use of Suwerd's song. The following orders, in addition to permanent crucifixion and relocation to the underplane, have been commissioned for Frederick's punishment. These punishments are to be shared also by those who have fought alongside Frederick at the time of capture. Frederick's snout is to be removed from the remainder of his face, so he may be discouraged from both seducing those who might listen to his words, and the bending of his flames. Frederick's crucifix is to be set aflame once he has been firmly secured to it, so he may feel the same pain he has placed on those who have faced him. Frederick's chest is to be opened, and stomach disconnected from his internal roots, but not removed. It must remain in his shell so that he may grow weak through the Maker's punishment. Disciplinary Order 2746-7 With deep regret and respect, we execute former crafter Agathos' punishment for her atrocities towards our Maker. Agathos served as Frederick's personal advisor and sister. Her loyalty, cunning, and foresight were the best of it, but were also her undoing. In better days, she architected the white rock which balances Frederick's great fire and encourages the waters she has created. Her punishment will be a loss to all. Prior to her current state, Agathos followed Frederick's example, and has betrayed our Maker by aiding Frederick in the planning of all strategic decisions. 
Agatho's punishment has been tailored to reflect her actions. Agatho's final action before punishment was aiding Frederick in battle against the crafters, and was paralyzed and apprehended alongside Frederick by Seward Song. The following orders, in addition to permanent crucifixion and relocation to the underplane, have been commissioned for Agatho's punishment. These punishments are to be shared also by those who have sabotaged, hindered, or have otherwise served an indirect, mal intended role in serving Frederick. Agatho's shell is to be coated in white clay, which is to be sculpted in her image, so that her shell may reflect her accomplishments and beauty once it has dried. Agatho's eyes are to be removed from her shell. She is then to be placed on an invertedly pinned crucifix, so that her blood may drain and her bad intentions could be released. Agatho's blood, once drained, is to be replaced with water exposed to the holy soot so that any sin within her is dissolved from our existence. Disciplinary Order 2746-8 With regret and sorrow, we execute scholar Clovis's punishment for her atrocities towards our Maker. Clovis served as the official oracle of Her beauty, intelligence, and services were the greatest of but were also her undoing. We wish to say that her services were useful in better days, however, her greatest accomplishments were, up until her final actions, during our darkest days. Prior to her current state, Clovis was willing and able to provide services of both intimate, restorational, and intellectual natures to all citizens when in dire need, and was responsible for the apprehension of, Dadith Serpent, may its name be forgotten, and may it be forever hated expunged which is considered the beginning of our great war. Due to her unwilling involvement with Frederick, Clovis shall not be charged of death. Prior to her current state, she provided her services to Frederick, and served as an informant to his cause. Clovis was discovered being eaten by several honorable class citizens who served Frederick. Due to direct intervention from, redacted, the following orders have been commissioned for Clovis's punishment. Clovis's left eye is to be penetrated with a burning needle, so that her gift may be revoked. Clovis is to be assigned a human shell, so that she can no longer return to it. This shell is to reflect the injuries she received from her assailants, so that in time, she may decay. Once placed in this shell, Clovis's neck is to be cut so that the head should dangle loosely from her body. This so that her focus may be placed on keeping herself in her shell. Document 2746-9 A word to those who find this place. Congratulations. You found a... Go back. Go back, and forget about it. You would be much better off. If you insist, fine, but just humor someone trying to give you advice, and read this first. You probably knew of a thought of it as a paradise, a holy ground where nothing could have gone wrong, death couldn't touch anyone, and everyone was content. No sin. I suppose it was. Not any more. We've abandoned that notion a long, long time ago. Get this in your head right now. Is dead. After what happened, we fought each other. I had to watch as our brother, our sister, our sons and daughters were starved into madness and pinned to a cross, and half the time, I was the one who had to do it, the other times, it was sorry. There were those I had no mercy for, the ones that tortured, the ones that indulged. Then there were the ones I regret, those I knew personally. I almost didn't do it, but I thought I had to. So I did. I am a very different person because of what happened here. I miss my friends. I miss the old me who liked to just sing and fuck around. I miss the times where we all liked each other, the times where no one was hurting, and the times where protector only meant breaking up an argument every now and then. I would give up anything to return to that time. That's why I don't want anyone seeing this place anymore, it's bad ground. If some authoritative body finds it, fine, I don't care so long as you have it left alone. It's a graveyard not an attraction. Do I feel like a protector? 
No, I don't. I resent that title, and any time someone calls me that, I feel dead inside. The only person I could relate to is Sari, and that's because she did the same things I did. The two of us are the only ones left, the others. They couldn't handle being the only ones left, so they just gave up. We had the opportunity to join them, but it didn't feel right at the time, especially after everything we've done. Now, we just want it forgotten. We want a chance at a happier life, and hopefully we've got that by the time you read this. Hopefully, when we've cleaned the slate, exchanged this divinity for simple, human lives, won't find us again. It's all we can hope for. Signed. Suwed. Annotation. Document 2746-9 required no translation, due to it being written in modern English. Doc 2746-9 is estimated to have been written, data expunged, years after the previous documents, approximately 140 years before the discovery of SCP-2746. Doc 2746-9 was found near the remains of a domestic cat, Felis Catus, and a Flemish giant rabbit, Orctolagus cuniculus, presumed to be the bodies of Suwerd and Sari. Thank you for tuning in. We hope that you enjoyed this broadcast. If you did please subscribe, like and share it around. If you have any particular case files you'd like us to cover in future broadcasts leave a comment below and we'll get around to it shortly. Tune in again tomorrow for more revelations.